Hey guys, welcome to part 5 of what if Naruto became heir to the demon of Kirigakure if you enjoy the video then like share and subscribe as it inspires me to make more such videos also check out my other playlist hope you would like them too. So let's get started. Chapter 14. The long road home and a rumble on the rooftop, Sasuke's pride versus Naruto's resolve. XXX. Pain. She'd felt it before, from a paper cut to broken bones. But never before had Shizun experienced what it was like to have her entire stomach savagely torn open. It burned as if someone had lit the digestive sac on fire, yet there was also a terrible pulsing that rippled from where the woman knew her belly button should be and spread across her entire body. Her body. Shizun didn't even feel being thrown through the air, her nerves never even registered hitting the earth. No, all that could be felt was that same burning that same nauseating pulse as Shizun lay on her side bleeding from the gaping hole in her body. She was the apprentice of Tsunade Senju, the world's most renowned medic, and had healed a variety of injuries both mundane and life-threatening over the years. But never before had the young woman been required to stitch together her own organs back together. There was no training for this sort of thing, no scenario that could be run, only the hope that such a fate could be avoided. Or that, in that very moment, Shizun would be of sound enough mind to mend herself. She wasn't. What Shizun was, was a terrible cocktail of shock, and fear swirling around the burning numbness of her injury. Did she want to die? Of course not. But her mind wasn't in the right state to recall just which techniques she needed to repair the damage done to her stomach. Besides, the pain was starting to fade anyway, so why worry? And this warmth that she could feel taking its place felt like she just climbed into a futon left to bask in the day's light. Hmm. A mischievous smirk made its way to the woman's face, a nap did sound nice. She'd been walking around with Lady Sinead for hours and her body was tired. Surely. She could close her eyes for a five minutes. And she'd be up again soon. Okay. Maybe six minutes. XXX. Ms. Shai Zun. All activity around the battlefield ground to a screeching halt at the sound of Naruto's desperate cry. The three Sanin whipped their heads to look and Swan's amber eyes widened in horror at the sight of her apprentice with her face in the dirt, blood soaking the front of her mesh shirt. Shai Zun. Her first apprentice who she'd taken in when the other woman had been just a girl, the daughter she'd never had. Dot lay dying. All at once memories of those years together spread across her mind like a scattered photo album, the smiles, the laughs, the tears. All of it. All gone. There wouldn't be another night of hot spring baths together, no more comfortable nights simply enjoying each other's company, no more of Shizun's well-meaning nagging to get her to quit her reckless behavior. It was all gone, Shizun was gone. And it was all her fault again. Fury, the likes of which the slug queen never knew, began to seep its way into her veins. It burned like molten lava, as it moved through her and centered in her sternum. The sharp, instant pain in her palms the only reason the blonde beauty even registered that she'd just bitten into the flesh with her polished fingernails. Tanade's entire body trembled even with every single muscles tensed in agonizing rage and through it all she never took her eyes off the dead form that was once her apprentice. If only she'd finished Rochimaru off sooner, if only she'd worked with Drea instead of against him, if only she hadn't left the other woman alone against Kabuto, if only she'd never left Konoha. If only. Without her even realizing it, Sinead's chakra had begun to leak from her pores. The crystal blue energy, wafting into the air like tendrils of smoke, radiated heat so fierce that the very molecules in the air turned to steam. Golden tresses fell over the woman's face as her head dropped in an effort to erase the vision of Shizun's lifeless corpse, framing the female Sanin's features in shadow as her body continued to tremble. How many times was she going to let this happen? How many more people were going to suffer because she failed to act, to plan to be there? Such questions raced through Sinead's mind as she imagined the deaths of Dan and Nawaki of how she could have kept them safe had the woman simply been there with them and now Shizun was being added to this terrible list all because she'd repeated that same stupid mistake. Well, no more. No more. In a bright, brilliant flash Sinead's chakra erupted from her very being in an angry blue flame. The ground beneath her feet gave way under the pressure of her power, stripping the earth of every single blade of grass within 50 feet of the furious Sanin. 
All other eyes on the battlefield looked on in disbelief at the degree of power, but Drea's own mask of amazement transformed into one of even greater surprise when he realized one very important fact. Sinead hadn't even released her yin seal. This. This is the power of the Senju clan. The granddaughter of the first Hokage, grand niece of the second Hokage sucked in a deep breath and felt her runaway power return to a steady flow. The tightness in her chest eased just a bit, but the icy rage at her core remained intensifying when Sinead shot her harsh gaze over towards Kabuto. Her knuckles popped as she flexed her fingers an image of the despicable little toad splattered across the ground clear in her head. You. That single word came out in a guttural spit, the buxom blonde's teeth grit tightly. You're going to pay for what you've done. A cocky, over-eager smirk molded its way over Kabuto's disgusting face as he gave his attention to the woman challenging him. Ha, ah, and who's going to be the one to make me? Surely not Yutsunate. The Oni pill has given me more than enough power to crush the weakest of the Sanin. You may be the last Senju, but you are nothing compared to Lord Orochimaru. In an instant, the hideous laugh that followed was cut short by a bloody cough no one not even her fellow Sanin could follow Sinead as she launched forward to slam her fist into Kabuto's stomach. Blood and bony gore splattered through the air right before Orochimaru's right hand man found himself dropping to the ground. A hundred feet away from the lower half of his body, a heavy numbness kept the teen from noticing, until he attempted to get back on his feet. W what? What did you do to me? Kabuto could feel his heart pump erratically as his enhanced body went into shock. The sleazy trader's mind struggled to come to grips with the fact that he'd just literally been torn apart. What kind of technique was that? A shadow blocked the sun and drew the mutated Odo Shinobi's bloodshot gaze away from his mutilated midsection, and up to the blonde Kun Oichi towering over him. It was a bloody cough that punctuated the way Kabuto's heart clenching in fear as he looked upon Sinead's vicious image. Shadowed features and cold, merciless stare coupled with the older woman's imposing and lean physique finally reminded the younger Shinobi that his opponent was called the world's greatest Kun Oichi for a reason. Technique. Stupid boy that wasn't any sort of ninjutsu, I tore you apart with my bare hands, my own power. You think that just because you've given yourself a pitiful little power-up that you're a match for me, but a pathetic little nobody like you won't ever be a match for the world's last senju, you'll be lucky to ever even be a match for that blonde knucklehead over there at the rate he's going. Kabuto felt as if his lungs were being squeezed as he tried to suck in enough air to keep his brain from going dark, his heavy heart continued to try and pump blood even as it flooded out through his bisected waist and fear rushed through every living cell of the dying teen's body. And yet, even with all this evidence, the battered youth could not accept his defeat. And no. No. T this can't be real, it must be a genjutsu. I couldn't possibly have been defeated by a drunken louse like you. Tsunade lifted her right hand, pointing a single finger at the downed young man, and began to build up a dense ball of lightning chakra at the digit's tip. Simple-minded fool, choose to disbelieve it for the last remaining minutes of your miserable life if you want. It makes no difference to me just know that both you and your lord will both burn in hell for the rest of eternity for what you've done to Shizun. Kabuto, Yakushi's life ended with a crack of one of nature's greatest powers. And yet Sinead's icy fury did not dissipate a single iota. Instead the woman's overwhelming rage found a new target, the dead spy's master. Dark and cold her stare would have been enough to make a normal shinobi wet themselves, but even if Orochimaru was good at masking his emotions, there could be no denying to himself that for the first time since facing Itachi Uchiha, a blanket of fear enveloped his very soul. Should his former teammate get her hands on him, he just may die. Sweat beaded its way down the side of his pasty, white face as he struggled to swallow under the pressure of Swan's key. Somewhere in the back of his impeccable memory, the image of a frightened Kunoichi filtered through his brain, and the similarities between moments sparked the snake Sanin's own anger. He was not some weak, little genin. He was Orochimaru, Sanin of Konoha and soon to be ruler of the entire shinobi nations. The tangy taste of his own blood splattered against his tongue as his fang pierced the corner of his lip, the sharp pain bringing feeling back to his legs, right before leaping into the air. He'd hoped never to reveal this to anyone, but it seemed he had no choice. Chakra flaring, Orochimaru began to concentrate it into his mouth the power built and multiplied upon itself until the traitorous genius felt it sufficient enough to cover his escape. 
only to lose it as an elbow came crashing into his nose. Blood instantly flooded the vile fiend's lungs as his tongue was sliced apart by his own teeth and as he soared through the air Orochimaru wondered how that one shot wasn't enough to kill him until his answer came in the materialization of his attacker Naruto Izumaki. He'd forgotten about the boy. Twisting away from the next attack, Orochimaru retaliated with a fierce kick that the younger blonde had no hope of blocking before riding himself in the air, and quickly scanning for the other two foes he'd been left alone to face. Tanade was still just standing there, glaring at where he'd leapt from, but upon noticing Drea missing the deserter stretched his senses, and caught the sound of his old rival moving through the air. Smirking at the other man's predictability Orochimaru caught the toad sage's down swinging leg and jammed two fingers into the pit behind his knee before throwing the fool away like yesterday's garbage. But the snake summoner didn't have long to gloat before he was being pressed by the brat again. However, now that he was more focused, Orochimaru found it much easier to dance around the Jinchuriki's flying fists and feet, although the man gave Naruto respect for knowing not to try and engage him with Kenjutsu, choosing instead to focus on speed rather than power. Too bad, it's still not enough. Swatting away Naruto's back fist, the villainous shinobi took a shot at the boy's spleen before delivering a swift chop to the back of his neck to take him out of the game, but his serpent-like eyes widened as his foe burst into a cloud of smoke. Cursing to himself, Orochimaru scanned the area quickly, taking quick pleasure in seeing Drie trying to move without the use of his right leg, but only finding Sinead still stewing in her rage. The man's unasked question was answered though when his young opponent burst out from the ground in an effort to check him under the chin. Leaning back on his heel Orochimaru quickly delivered a hefty right into Naruto's gut and sent him flying back. With a second to breath, the snake Sanin took stock of his situation as he wiped the mess of blood from his face. As the bones in his face finished mending he saw Drea finally getting back to his feet behind him Naruto was hunched over hand on his gut, but with a fierce gleam in his azure orbs, all while Sanade continued to stare into nothingness. That was beginning to worry the snake Sanin. He'd seen every side of his former female squad mate, but never in all the years he'd known her had Sanade ever behaved this way. There was a part of Orochimaru that was angry that felt as if the last Senju was deciding he wasn't worth her anger, but a more silent part of himself was afraid, worried about just what sort of powered Swan was truly capable of as the blood relative of the first Hokage. That fear swelled and his heart stopped when the twin-tailed beauty finally rolled her head back and stared at Orochimaru over her shoulder. It was a single eye, but the sheer level of hatred was unmistakable, and a shiver made its way through the snake summoner's body even as he steeled his core for the incoming fight. He would not be caught unaware like that fool Kabuto. And yet the powerful nuke ninja still found himself hard-pressed to duck under the kick aimed to take his head from his shoulders. Orochimaru felt the wind pressure leave a blood trailing down his cheek even as he stepped back and prepared to wrap his tongue around Sinead's throat and barely had a second to bring his leg up to take the donkey kick aimed for his stomach. The Sanin's teeth rattled as he grit them in pain, the feeling of his bones vaporizing into dust being just quick enough for him no to feel the full extent of them splintering apart first, before rolling across the field to end up on a lone knee. Tane found herself just missing her former teammate's head as she went after him the mid-kick sending a slice of pressurized air off before she turned to watch Orochimaru emerge from underground good as new although she found herself capable of sensing the drain on his reserve such a technique had cost him. The lone female Sanin had heard of her family's amazing abilities had seen it in action with her grandfather and his brother, yet never before had the last of Senju bloodline ever believed she herself was capable of the amount of power. She felt it starting to build upon learning of Shizun's death, felt how difficult it was for her to control as she dealt with Kabuto, and even now the world's greatest medic found herself hard-pressed to rein herself in. As much as she'd wanted to immediately go and turn Orochimaru into a splat against the grass Sinead was worried that a single step would fissure the very earth, so she waited, she breathed and attempted to wrestle back control over her own power. But it wasn't enough. I almost overshot him, and then again, just now I had to stop short. Sinead cursed mentally as she stared across the way at her wary opponent, he was handicapped and clearly outmatched, but because of her meandering over the years she was unable to take advantage. She felt that familiar self-loathing creep up from her core, but this time the last Senju stomped it out with the promise that this would be the last time Orochimaru would ever escape from her, right before she watched him shunching away. Her senses catching movement before her sight Sinead called to her fellow blonde not to move. 
He's out of your range now, Andrea won't be able to keep him occupied long enough for you to catch up and help. Well what about you with power like yours how can you just be okay with letting him go? Especially after what just happened minus. Because right now I can't control my power Naruto. The Kunoichi's tone was stern and brokered no room for argument, yet the younger of the pair could hear something else too. She was angry frustrated with herself and her inability to fully avenge the woman who'd been the closest thing to a child she'd ever have. And so Naruto stood down, going to retrieve his sword while his head hung in defeat and frustration. But when Sinead's voice filled the empty battlefield again, her words brought hope back to his heart and lit the fire in his eyes again. Not now, no, but then what sort of Hokage would I be if I was afraid of my own power? I will go back to Kanahagakur, I will learn to control my family's power and make it my own, and then. And then I will avenge Shizun's death. With the sun settled high in the sky, the light seemed to wrap Sinead in a brilliant halo, as if she were an angel of victory, her hair shone and eyes hard but brilliant, the shadows playing across her in perfect shades. Naruto found he could do nothing but believe in her conviction. With Shizun's core sealed away the trio's trip back to the village was swift, the woman's funeral less so. Sinead abstained from the passing of the hat, in favor of a wake for her lost companion. Was it the best thing after the people had lost their former cage? Absolutely not. Yet Sinead found herself lost in her own grief, she did not require any of the villagers to attend as they did not know Shizun, but she did refuse them their wishes to hold a festival upon her inauguration. These were not happy times, and she would not pretend that they were. But Sinead wasn't the only one dealing with the hard truth of life. Upon returning home Naruto found himself locked inside his apartment, knees to his chest staring blankly at the letter he'd received before the retrieval mission. Glad that Aizoribi was busy with class, the whisker Chunin took the time to focus on all that had happened during his last mission. Recalling how savagely he'd accepted the news, now the last as a Maki only felt hollow as he recalled the scolding he'd received from Drea days ago. Was he being too rash, too quick to accept the words scripted in this letter? And he didn't actually know who'd written it. A mental picture of Orochimaru offering Sinead the lives of her loved ones in exchange for his hands again filtered through Naruto's memory and it left him feeling sick. What would he do if this letter turned out to be someone's attempt to manipulate him in such a manner, or worse, what if it was a trap? As much as he wanted, needed it, to be true Naruto's original zeal soured as these depressing notions made themselves known. And as much as he hated to admit it, the Toad Sage had a point. He needed to start acting more like Chunin, more level-headed, and stop letting his emotions get the better of him, no matter how much pain the truth may bring. There would be time to grieve and despair to rage and explode, but not out in the field. So, it was with the letter crumpled in his hand and a heavy feeling in his heart, that Naruto hefted himself up onto his feet, and began the trek to the Hokage's office. The newly appointed Godame hadn't been present for the Nine Tails attack and as such would be one of the least likely people to be part of this possible conspiracy that the Uzumaki boy was warring with himself over. Besides that, Naruto knew that the woman now had access to the every resource in the village, something he hoped would bring him answers sooner rather than later. It was a risky plan overall, he never knew if his quest for knowledge may reach unwanted ears, but there was little else the blonde could think of aside from his original solo hunting that hadn't been entirely appealing the first time either. I just hope I'm not making a big mistake. XXX. Turns out the only mistake Naruto found himself making was forgetting that his village's newest Hokage doubled as their greatest medical ninja on top of being their leader. Such an oversight had the blonde being turned away from Sinead's office by her secretary and told to check the hospital. Yet on his walk there the young Chunin was met with the shock of running into both Ino and Ten Ten. I'm visiting Guy Sensei, the bun-haired weapon user explained from the curious boy's right. Apparently he got into a scuffle with some intruders and one of them broke his leg, which is honestly pretty freaky because Sensei's the strongest person I know besides my dad, so whoever managed that must have been a monster. Ino's reason turned out to be similar, though it surprised Naruto. Sakura's hardly left Sasuke's side since he was brought back along with Kakashi and the others. I've been going and taking her food, but the nurses have told me it usually needs to be thrown out since Sakura hardly eats. 
It's been scaring me to watch her go down this spiral, and I'm hoping that having Lady Sinead finally here to help Sasuke will snap her out of it. Hearing that his fellow blonde wasn't making the last Achiha her priority was something that Naruto hadn't expected from the once devout Achiha fangirl. Though taking a closer look at Ino's eyes let the last Izumaki know that there really was a change happening inside the young heiress. One that would greatly affect the rest of her life. When it came to the two girls sending him questioning looks of their own however, Naruto fumbled with what to say since he wasn't too keen on letting them know about the letter stuffed in his pocket. Aya was seeing if there'd be a mission to go after the guys who put Kakashi Sensei and Sasuke in the hospital they may not technically be my team anymore. But I'll always consider myself a member of Squad 7. Besides, I. I wanted to check on Sinead, to see how she was holding up you know. And the pair did know, to an extent. Shizun's funeral had been something everyone in the village had been made aware of, since it had been the thing to cancel their newest Hokage's coronation ceremony and the subsequent festival that came with it. Both Kunoichi's hearts had gone out to the legendary female shinobi, even if they weren't fully aware of what had happened, and could only really nod solemnly in understanding at Naruto's words before the trio continued their trek to the hospital in relative silence. It was at about the halfway point that the blonde remembered something important though, and in spite of Drea's warning Naruto told Ten Ten and Ino about his encounter with Kaizam and Itachi Uchiha. I guess that answers my earlier question then, the bun-haired girl hummed with her eyebrows raised, Kaizam Hoshigake really is called the monster of Kiri in his bingo book entry from what my dads told me. It's no wonder Guy Sensei had such a hard time with him, and you thought it was a good idea to try and fight him. It was either stall him or get taken Naruto countered with a toss of his hands. Would you rather they just captured me and did Kami knows what 1010? And here, I thought we were starting to get along. Ino actually turned out to be the one who bombed the wounded look on her fellow blonde's face. Putting her hand on Naruto's shoulder she turned the boy to look at her even as they continued walking. I don't think that's what she meant at all, and you don't believe that either. I'm sure what 1010 really meant was that she didn't want you ending up like her sensei or worse because you were trying to show off something we both know you have a history of Naruto. Sure, back at the academy you know, but this is the real world and I've changed the last Uzumpai counter. Yes who have, but that doesn't mean your friends aren't going to worry about you. And that includes us, the platinum blonde said softly. Just keep that in mind next time, okay? I, I mean we don't want to hear that something terrible happened to you if there was a way around it Naruto. Stunned Azure eyes locked with pupil less baby blues as the young Jinchuriki tried to connect the pretty girl wearing the mask of concern with that same face being twisted into a mocking sneer as was so common during their childhood. Yet the longer Naruto looked, the harder it became to pull himself away until it began to feel like he was drowning in Ino Yamanaka's endless pools, right up until a hearty shove shook the whiskered blonde from his trance. That's right you dummy, I can't have my sparring partner going and getting himself killed off. Ten Ten boasted as she threw her arms around the startled Chunin. Besides, you made a promise that we'd work together to help me get my hands on the famous Cuba Blades, and last I heard you don't break promises right. This led to a spatter of playful banter between the pair, while Ino looked on from the side, her face a mix of confusion and embarrassment as the heiress thought back to just a few moments ago. Dot when she almost kissed Naruto Uzumaki. The revelation came the moment whatever spell she'd been under was broken by Ten Ten's reintroduction to the conversation, and Ino was quickly reminded of the last time she'd felt such a strong pull, a dream the girls had the night Naruto left with the perverted old man. They'd been in her family's flower shop like before, but this time there had been no interruption and Ino had given in to the strange pull that drew her to the whiskered boy. In her dream Naruto's lips were rough and unpracticed, there was a hint of something like the salt of ramen broth on his breath. But the way it made Ino's whole body tingle even after waking from the shock made the Yamanaka heiress start to wonder. How would Naruto's lips taste in real life? It was a mystery she'd been just about to solve until her fellow Kun Uichi butted in. And while Ino knew her embarrassment came from almost kissing Naruto as a maki in public after making it known for so long how she felt about Sasuke Uchiha the confusion came as the pretty flower girl began to notice a budding sensation she'd not known since the rivalry with Sakura. Jealousy. The emotion left a tingling vibe in the air, 
one that vibed against the hairs at the back of Inno's neck and left a bitter taste in the girl's mouth as her pink lips parted just so. And yet, in spite of the heiress' familiarity with such a nasty emotion, it wasn't in the reflection of Inno's own baby blues that she found the green tint. It was ten tens. And the girl doesn't even realize it, Inoichi's daughter noticed as she watched her fellow blonde talk with the weapon user. It was so easy to see that the bun-haired Kunoichi was feeling the same warm whirlwind of butterflies in her tummy as Ino, what with the way Ten Ten seemed so eager to be in Naruto's personal space and the constant light touches or playful shoves. But something the platinum blonde easily identified was that her fellow Genin wasn't actually aware of what she was doing. As if Ten Ten were subconsciously trying to nudge Naruto into thinking about her that way first and getting the whisker tune in to do the asking out. Ino would have groaned at this, she'd hoped her only competition would be the timid Hinata. Yet just as the pretty girl was lamenting another annoying rivalry for a boy's attention Ino stopped herself with a very important realization. If Ten Ten wasn't actually going to confront her own feelings for Naruto and Hinata was too shy to speak up, then she was in the best position to snag the Uzumaki's full attention. But just as Ino was about to squeal in happiness at the thought of finally getting her romance story started she was reminded of the talk she and that very same object of her affection had right before Naruto's departure. Yes, Ino Yamanaka was crushing on Naruto as a maki but Who was Ino Yamanaka anymore? This was something the heiress had been trying to figure out since that afternoon at her family's shop, and while there was still no concrete answer yet there was one thing Ino was sure of. She did not want to be a kunuichi anymore. The life was simply too dangerous filled with far too many unknown variables that could go wrong, and as someone who wanted to eventually become a mother there was just no room in Inno's life for such things in her life. Then truly, there was the girl's vanity being taken into consideration as well. Inno was pretty of that there was no doubt, she could also be cute and classically beautiful depending on the occasion. And the youngest member of the Yamanaka clan was extremely proud of. Her body, though just beginning the winding road of puberty, was soft and easy on the eyes with just the right amount of muscle in the correct places. She'd never been one to take interest in fad diets like Sakura and the other girls of their class her father having drilled it into the platinum blonde's head how important optimal nutrition was for not only a kunoichi, but a healthy future mother as well. This dedication to health lead to Inno's undisputed place as the prettiest flower among a garden of weeds with only Hinata's princess-like features posing any sort of threat. But then this begs the question of what continuing down the path of being a kunoichi would mean for her looks. Sure there were women like Kirena and Anko who were both still beautiful, but Inno's critical eye had easily caught on to the small scars and healed burns that marred those women's bodies as well as the firmer muscle tone that helped fill out their clothes two things that Ino Yamanaka did not want for herself. Even if her future husband, who the girl's current mind had as a handsome whiskered blonde dressed in the robes of a cage swore up and down that he loved Ino as she was and told the girl that they still found her to be the most beautiful woman in the world the heiress knew that deep down she'd never believe it. Because Ino wouldn't love herself anymore. And then there was her dream of motherhood, what if something happened on a mission? What if she narrowly escapes death by being stabbed or impaled, but loses the ability to actually have children? Ino wasn't sure she'd be able to live with herself should such a thing occur. Or Kami forbid, the platinum blonde actually realize her dream only to be killed while out on a stupid escort mission. No, there were just too many important negatives to the life of a kunoichi for Ino Yamanaka to continue down the path she'd set upon in an effort to attract some boy's attention. And boy was the perfect way to describe Sasuke Uchiha now that Ino had begun to reevaluate her life. But before she could begin to fall down that rabbit hole of thought again the heiress was shaken out of her mind by the realization that she and her fellow, for the time being, Ninja of the Leaf had arrived at the hospital. Aya was really out of it, huh? Yeah, Naruto chuckled, you missed 1010 10 heading off to see super bushy brows. But I figured since we're pretty much going to the same place I'd let you know we were here. Come on, you can show me where Sasuke's room is, and we'll see if Sinead's had a chance to see him yet. Giving a soft hum in agreement, the platinum blonde lead the whisker tune in through the hospital and up to where she knew the Achiha was being kept. Yet, as she walked beside her fellow blonde Ino couldn't help but think that now was the best time to bring up the feelings that had been building up inside since that day at the flower shop. H hey, Naruto-kun, could we stop for a second? 
Surprised since his companion hadn't ever made a habit of calling anyone other than Sasuke-kun, Naruto did as Ino asked and stood with her in the hallway just a few feet from the aforementioned boy's apparent designated space. Um, sure Ino W what's up? Memories of how easily she crowed about her love for Sasuke less than a year ago made Ino frustrated that attempting to tell Naruto something similar was already proving to be so hard. Digging her toes into the tiled floor, arms down and hands locked, the heiress looked like the vert definition of a girl about to make a confession and she knew it. But for whatever the reason the words would not come. More than once Ino opened her mouth, ready to ask the admittedly handsome Chunin out to lunch, but every time the words died on the tip of her tongue while the platinum blonde felt her heart beat harshly against her breast. It went on like this for five minutes, but to the socially inept Uzumkai it felt like an hour and he was beginning to get uncomfortable. The letter in his pocket felt as though it were beginning to grow heavier with each passing second, reminding him of the real reason he'd even come to the hospital. Um look you know I'm sure whatever you have to say is important, but minus. I decided to quit being a kunoichi. What was supposed to be request for a date turned into a confession of her career change, and the girl hadn't even really managed to raise her voice above a heated whisper even though in her own mind Ino swore she'd yelled loud enough for the whole building to hear her. Cursing mentally while her eyes squeezed shut in trepidation, the pretty heiress stood among the silence of the hospital hallway with nothing but the echoing beeps of heart monitors to keep her company. And just as Ino was afraid her fellow blonde was about to explode into a frenzy of disbelief at her decision, Ino was pleasantly surprised when instead she heard. Honestly, I'm glad after seeing how shaken up you were during the invasion, and how you seemed so unsure back at your family's shop it makes me happy to know you took time to really think about what you wanted Ino. Do you know what you'll do instead? Happy. He was happy for her. Even her father had held a speck of disappointment in his eye at the news since it meant the loss of another Ino Shika Cho generation, but as Ino stared into Naruto's warm blue gems the girl could only see honesty and relief. And this was what made the heiress begin to truly think that her change in careers wasn't the only thing her heart might be right about. It also gave her an opening. And no not yet, but maybe you can help me think of something I mean. W we could. That is as you want to talk about it over some ramen sometime. Or something maybe? Naruto wasn't sure if it was the oddly shy tone of her voice or the way Ino looked at him from under her long lashes with a soft blush over the bridge of her cute nose, but a feeling he'd long since forgotten began to fill his belly. With Temurai it had been a strange heat that passed between them and made him ask her out. But here and now the blonde Jinchuyuriki could sense that same tingle that made his whole body zing like it had only one other time. The day he met Sakura. Flashes of a little girl with pink hair and wet green eyes crying because of the mud on her shirt and the way she beamed at him after switching tops and handing her a flower he'd originally picked for Aim, capped off by the soft press of lips against his whiskered cheek and a childish declaration of love. It was over in seconds, but the rush of feeling that it had brought with it left Naruto in a daze. Could this really be happening? What if it fell apart again? What about when she learned about the Nine Tails? because there was simply no way Naruto could imagine keeping such a secret from any girl he tried to date. The poor, lonely Chunin just wasn't sure what to do. Ino though was beginning to take her fellow blonde silence as a rejection. Tears started to fill the corners of the girl's eyes, giving them a sad yet beautiful shine, and in an effort to keep some semblance of her dignity Ino dropped her head and began to speed walk her way down the hall. I it's okay, if you don't want to, I I know you and I have and never really been friends, I just thought minus. Whatever else she might have said was cut off by the strong yet surprisingly gentle hand that caught her arm as Eno passed. Calloused and warm, there was a wonderfully delicious spark that raced over both blonde skin, the whole of her arm, the palm of his hand. And although she was a whole inch taller, the heiress felt as though she were two feet tall under the weight of the boy's stare. It hurt Ino's heart to see just how scared Naruto looked to understand why her fellow blonde had such a fragile glimmer of hope hidden underneath a layer of curiosity. Ino did you. Are you asking me out? The quiet voice his fear, it made her start to realize just how bad he'd had it and made the platinum blonde really take a look at her feelings before answering. Because she didn't want to be someone who caused this boy any more pain because she wasn't sure she could live with the consequences of what might happen if she did. 
they were young, and that realistically meant that they may not make it to the fairy tale ending that Eno had been thinking about before, but she also knew how passionate both of them were about the things they loved. Knew how brilliantly, they could shine together if they stayed the course. You asked me before, what I wanted in my life well. What if what I want is you Naruto as a Maki? Then you need to mean it. The Jinchuiriki whispered, his hands sliding down to lace their fingers together. Because I'm not Sasuke, I have real feelings. You hardly gave me a second look for years, and when you did it was so you could make fun of me, so I'm sure you can see why I'm not gung-ho about this. I won't be his replacement, I'm done being second choice. Naruto-kun that's not minus Ino tried to defend her feelings to reassure him, but Naruto cut her off sharply. Don't, don't call me that. You've only ever said that to Sasuke, so don't think for one second I'm gonna let you use it on me. Now you're very pretty Ino and I know pretty much every guy in our age group with a brain would bend over backwards for the chance to take you out. But when it really comes down to it we don't know each other at all. So here's what I think we should do, you think about why you suddenly want to go out with me, and then when you've got an answer you think I want just throw in the trash, you come talk to me again. If I like what you have to say, we'll go from there and if not then we forget this whole thing even happened how's that sound? It hurt to be turned down more so than it ever had when Sasuke brushed her off, but the Yamnaka heiress took stock in the fact that Naruto wasn't necessarily saying no and had instead given Ino the chance to prove that she wasn't going to treat him like some sort of toy. Filling her gaze with as much affection as she could muster the platinum blonde gave Naruto's hand a determined squeeze as she nodded. T that's fine with me Naruto. Thank you. For the second time that day their moment was shattered however, this time by the actual shattering of glass. Drawing the two young teens attention they moved quickly down the hall and found that the noise had been a plate of apple slices that Sakura had been attempting to feed a newly awakened Sasuke, the dark haired Avenger's hand still raised from the act. The pink haired Genin was busy trying to clean up the mess as Naruto and Ino came in, the blue white girl asking about what happened. And nothing Eno pig, I just forgot that Sasuke-kun doesn't like apples, now go away, I already told you that I didn't need your help to take care of him. From the looks of it he doesn't want your help either, Naruto scoffed as he eyed the bed-ridden Achiha. Wow, awake for all of an hour at best, and you're already back to being a huge jerk. What? Trying to build up your hatred? Sasuke's entire body stiffened, and his knuckles popped as he closed those fingers into a fist. A dark, heavy aura began to fill the room as Sakura and Ino looked between the two boys in confusion, and a hint of worry for their chosen crushes. It was the female member of Squad 7 though who found her voice first, and she hissed angrily at the blonde Chunin after throwing the last of the ruined snack in the trash. Why don't you take Ino and get lost, Naruto Baka, can't you see you're only making Sasuke-kun upset with your stupid comments? Gee Sakura shut up already? The pinkette gasped at he former teammate's harsh tone when are you going to get it through your thick skull that Sasuke doesn't like anyone, including you. He's a pissy little boy who never bothered to talk to anyone about what happened and now carries it around like a cancer that'll never go away. Until he wakes up and realizes that he's never going to catch up to Itachi. That got a reaction and as Sakura screamed from being shoved aside Ino realized that her former crush had moved from his position on the bed to standing nose to nose with Naruto before she could even blink. The tension grew thick enough to taste in the air, and the Yamanaka heiress was seemingly nailed to her spot as she ran her frightened gaze over the unrecognizable face of who used to be Sasuke Uchiha. His jaw looked as if it might shatter under the weight of the genin's own clenched teeth while a nasty snarl twisted the Avengers' once princely features. Sasuke's newly twisted Sharingan blazed in all its inverted glory even as the angry boy's scarred optical orb remained a cold onyx black. You're so angry because you know it's true Naruto smirked. What? You think your brother's just sitting around waiting for you to kill him? Of course not. A man like that's been keeping himself sharp, getting stronger, every time you took one step closer, I guarantee Itachi leapt over at least 10 more ahead. Face it Sasuke, the old Uchiha clan is dead and gone, why don't you let them rest and start over instead of risk letting their legacy go extinct just to satisfy your little pipe dream. Naruto-kun. Sasuke-kun. With a crash the furious Uchiha air had his former teammates back pressed against the far wall of his hospital room, a web of cracks spreading their way out from behind Naruto's high-collared sleeveless shirt. 
He'd foregone wearing the flak jacket since reading the letter, but even without the extra padding the blonde found that he didn't really feel the impact, and this made Naruto smirk. I really hope this isn't all you've got Jenin, because it's pathetic. You want to see everything I've got Dobe? Then let's go outside that stupid turn and kept me from showing you just how much I've surpassed you. But now there's nothing to come between us now. The roof's more than big enough, so what do you say? I say Naruto scoffed before vanishing reappearing by the open window with challenging smirk on his face. What's taking you so long scary cat? Watching their crushes disappear before their eyes Sakura and Ino gave each other matching stares of horror before scrambling out the door and racing to the roof. XXX. Looking across the way at his former teammate Naruto was surprised to find that the anticipation he'd been expecting to felt simply wasn't there anymore the drive he'd once had to best Sasuke and prove himself superior had vanished somewhere between pulling Kubai Kiriboko from the dirt and losing his spar to Tsunade. And yet, there was something deep inside that seemed to push the boy to instigate this fight, to show off and dominate the uppity clan air. I see you left that silly sword of yours at home Sasuke called with a mocking smirk. What afraid I might break it? Or maybe you realized that carrying around such a pointless hunk of metal didn't do anything more than make you look like an even bigger idiot than you already are. Naruto's canines gleamed as his own grin widened the rugged whisker marks stretching over the boy's cheeks to aid in making the last Izumaki look all the more like a feral fox. You'd better be glad I didn't bring my silly sword dumbass, wouldn't wanna accidentally chop that ugly mug off because you were too slow to duck one of my swings. The sneer that curled Sasuke's lip looked out of place on such a young face. Big talk from the dead last, but the time for words is over, time to put up or shut up Naruto. You say you take my head, but you'll be lucky to even put a scratch on my forehead. With that the only sounds were those of combat as the Uchiha air went on the attack, his rage and insecurity pushing him forward. Images of his brother dismissing him like a bug of the constant strings of defeat and being disqualified, it all jumbled together into one big mess as the dark-haired Jenin lashed out at his former teammate with a vicious kick. Growling as his leg was caught, Sasuke pushed off the roof and spun his body into a smash attack aimed for the top of Naruto's head, only to have his frustrations fueled by having the attempt swatted away, as though the Achiha air were nothing but a gnat. Come on now, the blonde chuckled as he dodged around a series of punches aimed for his grinning face. Don't tell me this is all you've got. I'll never even get warmed up at this rate. Here, how about I show you how a real ninja fights? Even with his dajutsu's new power Sasuke found himself to be too slow against Naruto's return fire and he suffered for it as a bruise began to form on his cheek right before a palm strike sent the scarred boy flying back off his feet. Yet it didn't seem Naruto was done with him yet, because the blonde reached out to grab Sasuke's ankle before jerking and whipping him around in a small twister. Round and round they went until the Jinchuriki was satisfied, and the Sharingan wielder was left to flail through the air until he managed to right himself and land safely among the hanging laundry. Attempting to use the fluttering covers to his advantage the Achiha weaved his way through the sheets to come up behind his former teammate, and then coughed up spit as he was slammed by a backwards kick to the stomach. Really now, Naruto taunted as he turned to drive his fist into Sasuke's nose you've heard that I'm trying to take Zabos's title and your idea is to sneak up on me? What happened to being rookie of the year? Aren't you supposed to be smarter than this? Another shot of anger filled Sasuke's core as he realized that there could truly be no holding back against the whisker Chunin. This is a Maki wasn't anything like the boy he pummeled back at the academy. Gritting his teeth, the Avenger reached out with his true speed and wrapped his fingers around Naruto's incoming haymaker, ignoring the way his bare feet burned as they slid over the tiles of the roof. Putting on another boost of speed Sasuke closed in on the other boy's guard and landed his first successful strike in the way of an uppercut to the blonde's gut. But he didn't stop there. Once twice, three turned to four before the angry Achiha tangled his fingers painfully among his former teammate's spiky hair and brought Naruto's face down to meet his knee. With the Chunin's head snapping up from the impact Sasuke took advantage and swept the boy's legs out from under him. Watching gleefully as his opponent tumbled to the ground the last loyal Uchiha dropped hid weight and made to drive his elbow into the blonde's open gut. He grunted in pain however when Naruto used the replacement technique to switch with one of the fallen sheets leaving Sasuke to pile drive into the roof directly. 
Ignoring the agony though Mikato's youngest child sprang back to his feet and searched wildly with his lone sharing Ganai, just managing to catch the incoming images of Naruto's attack soon enough that he was able to dodge out of the way and counter with a side fist to the face. Only to curse when the body exploded, sending Sasuke flying across the rooftop and landing in a heap of sheets, while the real Izumaki made himself known by coming over and hauling him up. You still think you're better than me when you couldn't even see through such a simple strategy. Sasuke didn't answer with words, instead roaring as he went to sucker punch Naruto in the face. When the blonde deflected it he used the momentum to turn the attack into an aerial spin kick, but grunted in annoyance as the Chunin stepped back out of range. Closing his fingers together in the tiger seal, Sasuke unleashed a fireball at point-blank range, and watched as the orange blaze swallowed Naruto whole. Fine then, the blonde's voice called from behind, if we're using Jutsi now then how about you try this one on for size. Sasuke didn't have any time to avoid it, and cried out in pain as he was bombarded with a bullet of air that had the Achiha believing that a few of his ribs were either broken or bruised. This time it was a bit of a chore to get back to his feet, but Sasuke anger drove him numbing the pain so that he could keep fighting, so that he could prove himself. Deja vu, the feeling of already seeing. It was the perfect way to describe what Naruto and Sasuke felt as they were once again staring each other down from atop the hospital rooftop. Though this time the Achiha air was wiping blood from his lips, while the blonde Chunin looked no more worse for wear. A fact that only solidified Sasuke's decision to do what he did next. Recalling the training he'd done under Kakashi for the finals, the Sharingan wielder flipped through a set of hand seals before clutching his wrist tight, flexed fingers facing the ground. It was a pose Naruto had seen twice now, once on the Great Naruto Bridge, and then again during his opponent's scuffle with Itachi. The Kunari. Unfortunately, the young Chunin knew he had nothing to counter with since he had yet to complete the racing gan, which to the blonde meant he had only one other option. He had to catch it. Chapter 15. Fallout. XXX. When Ino Yamanako awoke that morning not once did she think that part of her day would be taking place atop the roof of a hospital standing beside her one-time best friend, watching as their crushes beat the shit out of each other. And yet, the heiress found that she couldn't take her eyes off of the brutal hand-to-hand -hand scuffle that was taking place before her eyes. Having seen her fellow blonde in action during the invasion Ino was still floored to see just how powerful Naruto really was as he seemed to effortlessly manhandle their graduating class rookie of the year, even after Sasuke got serious, the platinum blonde held no doubt that the whisker Chunin wasn't using his full strength. So while Sakura crowed beside her, shouting at the boys to knock it off, Ino knew that there was really only one way for this whole thing to end. And then Sasuke's hand was engulfed in a crackling shroud of lightning. Even between her father and the rest of the Inoshika Cho the Platinum Blonde had never seen any ninja use such a dangerous looking technique, let alone a genin and judging by the way Ino felt the very air around her warp itself around the four of them there atop the hospital roof she knew that it would be bad news for Naruto if it hit. However, before she could yell out to the two boys Ino was startled to see Sakura running to get in between Sasuke and their former teammate. That idiot. Sakura stop. The Yamanaka heiress had lurched forward and managed to grab the Pinkette's arm before she got too far ahead. What the hell do you think you're doing? L let me go you know I've gotta stop them Sasuke-kun might actually hurt Naruto with that attack. The girl's former classmate struggled to keep a hold on her, and once again Ino was reminded that she really wasn't cut out to be a ninja if she was having trouble keeping Sakura back. But the female member of Squad 10 only stared into the Pinkett's frightened eyes for a moment before catching motion from her peripheral. No, he won't, Kakashi's here to stop them. Something you would have noticed if you weren't so busy trying to get yourself killed billboard brow. And while this was true, there was that part of Ino who used to believe the Achiha invincible that silently wanted to now think her new crush would have easily bested whatever Sasuke's technique had been. But almost immediately after thinking it, Ino squashed that notion. If she was going to show herself to be better than the brat she'd been at the academy, then it needed to start here. Naruto wouldn't want a fangirl. If nothing else of this the heiress was certain. Ino was torn from her thoughts though when Sakura finally managed to yank herself free and made the short journey over to the last Achiha and the two upper ranked shinobi. Wanting to check on her fellow blonde, Ino didn't even give it a second guess to follow. As they drew near however she caught the jown in admonishing both Naruto and Sasuke, and this brought out that part of the heiress that she just tried to stamp out. 
What the heck, Kakashi Sensei? Why are you getting on Naruto about the fight? Didn't you see that crazy technique Sasuke was about to use? No way was that anything less than a B rank jutsu meant to seriously do some damage. He saw it alright, Tsunade revealed herself from the doorway, there's no way he couldn't considering Kakashi taught it to the little brat himself. You and are going to be having a talk about what's appropriate for Genin to be learning from their instructors, Patake, but first I wanna hear about what the hell these two were doing up here this is a hospital, not a training ground and what both of you just did was a crime. Any physical combat must be done in a regulated area away from civilians, and for breaking that rule you'll both be four black marks added to your service records. There were a great many reactions to this declaration because of how each other individual present took the news. For Naruto, it was shame. He'd only just earned his vest and already he was two points away from being demoted, a humiliation no Hokage in the Leafs history had ever suffered, and one that may very well affect his candidacy when he got older. Drea had warned him of something like this back during the debacle with Kabuto, but apparently the blonde found he hadn't really been listening. Ino was upset because she didn't think her fellow blonde really deserved such a harsh punishment, she too understanding what could happen to Naruto if he were written up again. One or two marks was understandable due to the severity of the act, but four just seemed overly harsh. It didn't help that Ino could clearly see the look of disgrace on her crush's face before he managed to put up a mask of indifference. Kakashi was worried, honestly, about himself. Yes, he was upset with Sasuke for using the technique he taught him against a fellow leaf ninja, as well as a superior officer at that, but what truly pricked at the copy ninja was the fact that his own status as Jounin was no doubt going to be called into question. With what was about to happen to Sasuke, and word no doubt going to spread about Naruto, it wouldn't surprise Kakashi in the least if Tsunade either demoted him or barred him from instructing another squad. Sakura was aghast, and it showed as she stared with wide eyes at the female Hokage. Four marks against Sasuke Kun's service record during his first year as a genin could only mean one thing. L Lady Tsunade, surely you don't mean that, I if Sasuke Kun's record is marked so harshly he'll minus. He sent back to the academy. Tsunade's voice wasn't cold, but it was firm. Any genin willing to use an A-ranked technique specifically designed for assassination against any member of their own village doesn't deserve the right to wear a headband. Sasuke Uchiha has shown with his actions here today that his graduation was a mistake, and that clearly the academy needs a complete overhaul of its standards if they're allowing this type of behavior to pass through its doors and represent the village. As of this moment, Squad 7 will be disbanded, and Achiha will be given the option to re-enroll in the ninja program once the reforms have been made, but not a moment sooner. To allow such a thing would defeat the purpose of his demotion. As for you, Sakura Haruo, you'll be delegated to the position of instructor assistant. Your book knowledge is great, better than most academy teachers, and I believe that at the moment this is your greatest asset to the village. Kakashi Hatake, you are now under review for your time as a Jounin instructor, I've read your file, and after today begin to wonder if it's safe to put you in charge of one so young. W well what about Naruto, Sakura cried as she swung her arm out to point at the blonde Chunin. He's the one who started the fight in the first place, why isn't he being punished? Where's his demotion? Shut up billboard brow, Ino leapt in with her eyes full of fury. Trust a girl with no shinobi background not to know about just how much those marks actually affect Naruto's future minus. Enough, Tsunade barked, effectively cutting out the two girls' squabble. While Ino does have a point, it doesn't matter here. What happens to my Chunin is left entirely up to me. In my eyes Izumaki now has a much better understanding of what his actions could cost him if he's not careful, which to me is more than enough. Naruto will not make this sort of foolish mistake a second time and that's what is important. Now, I want each and every one of you off this roof and either headed home or somewhere that you won't be causing any more trouble. Because if I hear any of your names again today, and it's not good news you can kiss your career goodbye. Dismissed. With that the last of the Senju strode back into the hospital to continue her work for the day, leaving the silent understanding that her orders were to be followed immediately. Kakashi sighed, pinching the bridge of his nose in exasperation before reaching over and going to grab at Sasuke's shoulder. Only to have it knocked away. Glaring at the boy with his one eye the Jounin hissed, this is not the time for one of your little tantrums Sasuke, 
you and I need to talk. But the silently fuming boy didn't care. He was being stripped of his rank, denied the right to even rejoin the ranks until the academy could be reformed and it would be for a completely unknown amount of time and due to the law of not allowing civilians to practice ninja techniques until they even entered the academy Sasuke would fall that much farther behind Itachi again. This spiraling thought process only added fuel to the fire raging in the last of his heart, and in a burst of speed he disappeared from the rooftop leaving his former sensei to growl in frustration. Before leaving himself to find Asuma for drinks, Kakashi told Sakura that she'd be best off finding the Hokage later for her reassignment. Even if she does manage to start an overall reconstruction of the academy's curriculum, it won't be overnight so you'll probably be helping out with the history instructor or basic strategy course. Lady Sinead will be the one to decide though which is why I suggest talking to her sometime this afternoon when she's not as busy. In a whirlwind of leaves there were now just the three former classmates left behind after that. Ino's attention was immediately drawn to her fellow blonde. Are you okay Naruto? I I know that couldn't have been easy for you. Is he okay? Sakura squawked. What about Sasuke Kun? The Hokage just cut him right out of the ninja ranks Ino pig and all you can care about is the fact this idiot got away with a slap on the wrist. What happened to you why aren't you more upset? The platinum blonde tried to keep her temper in check, but couldn't help being at least a little loud as she gave a heated response. Maybe because I've started to grow up Sakura. Maybe it's because I actually paid attention to the fact Sasuke just tried to kill Naruto. Or maybe it's because I'm smart enough to know that Naruto's dream of becoming Hokage could be hurt because of one stupid mistake. So instead of asking me why I'm not more upset about why Sasuke has to learn how to be a better person why don't you ask yourself why you don't even seem to care that your friend's own ambitions could be shot, or that he was almost killed. Because he's not my friend, and because I don't think that he'll ever have what IT takes to be the Hawksh. Months. That's how long it's been since Naruto had ever really had any sort of feelings for his female teammate, and while they really weren't what the blonde would consider friends, hearing that she didn't even believe in him as a former teammate hurt. Memories of the past of being scorned and made fun of resurfaced so fast that Naruto barely had time to put together a hasty goodbye to Ino before following in Kakashi's lead. The rooftops was silent for a moment after the two Kunoichi were left alone, but the tense atmosphere quickly made Sakura uncomfortable, and she muttered out an excuse to try and get away. Ino wasn't going to let her. How could you the platinum blonde growled, you know how important Naruto's dream is to him. What in the world made you think it was okay to say something so horrible? Hey. The pinkette smothered whatever shame she'd been feeling with indignation and spun around to glare at the girl who'd once been her best friend. Don't try to act like Naruto's your best friend or something Eno Pig, last time I checked, you didn't like him either. Since when do you have to like someone to treat them like a decent human being? Since I found out Naruto was a freak, Ino watched her one-time friend's eyes widen in terror before she snapped her mouth shut with an audible click of the teeth. Her own baby blues narrowed in suspicion, and the Yamanaka heiress leaned in close with eyebrows drawn together in curiosity. What did you just say, because it almost sounded like you called Naruto a freak? But even you can't be that cruel Sakura, so I must have heard you wrong. But the pink-haired Jenin just shook her head swiftly, backing away with a hand over her mouth. Sakura took two steps, then another before a muffled plea made its way out from between her fingers for Ino not to repeat what she'd heard. And my mom made me swear not to say that, not to talk about it. B, but Ino, you. You weren't there. Back then, on the bridge, and Naruto was. Was like some sort of monster. Forehead you're not making any sense, what could he have done to make you think such a terrible thing about him? Especially back then, he was still your teammate. What did he do? Kill someone? H. His chakra, Eno, Sakura's gaze was far away now, haunted as she recanted the horrible feelings that had washed over her so many months ago. The terror that still fueled some of the young Genin's nightmares. And Naruto's chakra was so angry, so evil. It was like the only thing he wanted was to tear everyone on that bridge apart, even us. Kakashi sensei talked to Sasuke kun and I but. Ino and my mother, she told me something I just really hope isn't true but. But it just makes too much sense. 
Ino could feel her stomach begin to knot as she listened to the pinkette whisper about the boy she'd come to hope for as a boyfriend. There was a painful lurch within her heart, and the feeling that she'd swallowed a mouthful of tax kept Ino from breathing. S. Sakura what? W. What are you talking about? What did she say? XXX. As Ino felt as though her whole world was spinning off its axis Sasuke Uchiha was trying to remember just what it was about the village of Kanahagakur that kept him inside its walls. His family was dead, the older brother he'd idolized nothing but a cold-blooded murderer, and now he wasn't even allowed to be a goddamned ninja. So why? Why stay? There was nothing for him here. Sakura's affections were pathetic and he placed no stock in trivial bonds of friendship, as like they'd been taught at the academy. If anything those things only made the Avenger that much more angry at the world, it was as though these people wanted him to simply forget about the ones he loved and leave their memory in the dust. Such blasphemy though was inconceivable, the Akas helped to found Konoha, they should never be forgotten, not ever. Yet they were. Slowly, but surely Sasuke felt as though his family's legacy was being left to rot away along with their corpses in the compound's crypt. This belief tore at the young heir's very soul as the last Achiha stood outside the building that had once been home to the village's police force. Blood still decorated the front wall, stained and black with age, while the crest that once spoke of proud shinobi heritage was now faded and worn after years of improper care. But then, Sasuke had never been able to bring himself to clean it to repaint or really touch anything. The compound in all its entirety was exactly the way it had been on that horrific night. Right down to the set of dishes set out for Sasuke's snack when he returned from practice. They, the village, had tried to change things to fix it. But the boy had refused and continued to demand that nothing be moved or changed. This was all the last act of every member of his clan, and the brooding youth wanted to keep their spirits alive through such mementos. People like Inoichi Yamanaka argued that it wasn't healthy and that being surrounded by the memory of his family's massacre would damage his mind, but what did that fool know, how could he understand when his family was still alive? It was one of the reasons Sasuke had rebuffed each and every attempt the man's daughter made for his attention, as he didn't need the girl's father trying to analyze the Achiha boy's every move from under the roof of their home. Pulling himself away from those types of thoughts, Sasuke found that he'd roamed far enough inward to the compound that his feet had taken him straight to the main house where he'd lived once with the people closest to his heart. Stepping inside, the last Achiha made sure to remove his shoes like always in respect for his mother before carrying on to his room, the one place in the entire sector that hadn't been tarnished by slaughter. The boy had never truly wondered before why such a thing had come to be, but as he let his eyes roam over every inch of that space Sasuke couldn't help but think about what might have been had he come home on time that night. Would he be resting beside his parents, nothing but bones and decayed flesh now, or maybe his presence would have reminded Itachi of what the young man would be giving up should he go on with his test. After all, the clan genius had chosen to spare him even after slaying the rest of their kin, so there had to be something special about him. Right? But even if there was, could he truly unearth whatever that was when Konoha seemed determined to undermine the boy's potential at every turn? No private tutor upon graduation. Disqualified from the Chunin exams, and then denied promotion for services during the invasion. Then failure to be given the first leading to a humiliating defeat at the hands of Itachi again. Followed by that. That bitch stripping him of shinobi status and forcing the last Achiha to accept a life of civility while that idiot Naruto simply got the equivalent of a slap on the wrist. What was he still doing here? The fury welled up inside Sasuke's core, and his nails bit into the calloused skin of the boy's palm just as a powerful wave of something absolutely delicious washed over the angry Avenger. Flashes of malicious yellow eyes, a pasty white face, a smug grin, all shadowed by the treetops, adding to the demented facade. And then, whispers. Whispers of a promise, one that could make him strong strong enough to kill Itachi and bring the Achiha clan back to their former glory. Those whispers grew louder, until it seemed as though the Sanin were standing in that very room shouting at him, and it was as Sasuke felt the last of Kakashi's pathetic attempts to seal the curse mark away that the boy realized that there was only one path for him now. If being a shinobi of Konoha wouldn't get him the thing he wanted most, then he couldn't be a shinobi of Konoha anymore. XXX. 
On the complete opposite end of the village Naruto could be found dragging his feet, wallowing in self-loathing as he silently continued to berate himself for his idiotic stunt back at the hospital. Why had he done that? What sort of good came out of taunting Sasuke when there was nothing to be gained from it, but trouble? These thoughts plagued the blonde chunin until they were all the boy had on his mind, and it didn't end until Naruto found himself bumping into someone he seemed to be meeting up with a lot lately. Wow Naruto, I'm starting to think you space out on purpose just to run into me. Oh oh, uh sorry Tenten, I'll watch where I'm going next time. Tenten wore a cheeky grin on her face until she noticed that her friend was nothing like how the girl had left him only a little earlier that afternoon. Pretty face folding into a look of honest concern, the brunette reached out and dropped a comforting hand on the blonde's shoulder. Hey, Naruto, I was only kidding. Why you seem really down did something happen when you went to find Lady Tsunade? She felt the way he tensed at the mention of such a meeting, and it helped put her on the proper path to consoling him well, whatever it is I'm sure it's nothing a nice rough spar couldn't help get your mind off of. Azure eyes blinked owlishly before their owner snorted in suppressed laughter at the look on his friend's face. That's all you think about isn't it? You're just as bad as I used to be you know. Watch it buster, Ten Ten tried to sound firm, but the grin tugging at her lips ruined the aesthetic. Besides, you did promise to help me train remember for when I face a Miyuri, and it's been long enough since the exams that I think we're both healed up enough huh? This time Naruto couldn't help himself and laughed as the older girl began to steer him in the direction of her home. Yeah, but you're forgetting something, I just got back from a dangerous mission. Shouldn't I get to rest a bit more, since you're in top shape, and I might be worn out? Yeah right, the weapon mistress scoffed playfully, you don't know the meaning of tired blondie, if the rumors I hear about how you train are anything to go by. Besides, my old man's been wanting to meet you since the day I told him about the match we had before the first exam. Here the blonde chumnin balked a little someone's parent wanted to meet him. Was that such a good idea, Naruto knew how most adults still felt about him even after all this time. But when he stammered out an attempt to decline, Tenten -ten shut him down hard. Besides, It'll make his day to finally get a chance at seeing one of Kiri's legendary blades, so there's really nothing you can say to get out of this Naruto, you may as well accept it. Plus, if you win I'll even treat you to ramen for dinner tonight. It had been spoken so fast that the Jinchuriki almost didn't catch it, but Naruto's ears were fine-tuned to the R word and with a joyous gasp and a quick backwards grab for the Kunoichi's hand he now began to be the one doing the pulling. Really? Well why didn't you say so? let's get a move on Ten Chan. So engrossed in the thought of all-you-can-eat ramen was he though, that the exuberant young ninja didn't even bother to look back to see that his friend's cheeks were burning with a cherry red blush. Ten Chan. Chapter 16. So Naruto, it's nice to officially meet you. He'd already known about the kid, and then heard a number of things about him from his daughter, but Sanosuke was always the kind of man who likes to forge his own opinions about people before passing any real judgment. So as the blonde Chunin stood before him, with Tenten -ten standing stiffly beside him, the former Sakite member couldn't help chuckling on the inside. Even if she wouldn't admit it, this meeting was very important to his daughter, she really wanted Sanosuke to like Naruto. And luckily, he did for the most part. As the man stared into those wary blue eyes, Sanosuke could see the anger and pain hidden away beneath that tough exterior. He saw it in the way Naruto carried himself as he'd entered unfamiliar territory, as well as how the blonde kept closer to the door in case he needed to make a quick getaway. It was the picture painted with the dark colors of a childhood alone, a life of scorn and hardship, a life Sanosuke himself knew all too well. Which is why the man offered the best smile he could to the young teenager as he welcomed Naruto into the house, directing the pair of shinobi into the kitchen for something to eat. You say you're going to spar, but first it'd be best to get some food in your system. Also, Tenten, -ten, if you don't mind I'd like to take a crack at seeing what Kanaha's newest chunin is capable of myself before you, and he go at it. W what? The weapon specialist shocked, Dad why? Well, part of it's a bit selfish. I've never gotten to cross steel with one of Kiri's legendary blades. This is the first time I've ever even seen one in person, and I don't think I'll ever get a chance like this again. 
It makes me happy to know Naruto was willing to send a clone out to fetch it before you two arrive. But besides that, I really do want to see if Blondie's as good as I've heard to see if he's really the son of the Red Death. Blue eyes narrowed and their owner's face shifted into a mask of hard speculation. Did you really know my mother, or is this gonna be like when I asked that perverted Sanin? He dropped her name too, but the old freak didn't have anything special to tell me, no one wants to tell me about her. It's probably because they all didn't know the real Kushina, most people didn't if you ask me. The number who did could probably be counted on one hand, it got harder though after she got pregnant with you. Why not? Naruto pressed, if people like you were so close to her, why couldn't they see her anymore? I can tell you, but not here. I've been summoned by our new Hokage for an assignment with Jeko Hayate, I'll request for you to come along as an extra hand and the two of us can tell you everything we knew about Kushina. Tenten -ten looked at her father with unbelieving eyes. D-Dad, I know how you feel about the council and all, but are you really that paranoid? Tenten -ten, I've made a very special point to explain my views on the spider web of government to you, so trust me now when I say that trying to talk about this sort of story within the walls of Konoha is very dangerous. Just this small conversation could be problematic if the wrong person hears us having it, so promise me you'll never tell anyone we had it, understand? Of course, I, I'd never do anything to put you or Naruto in danger, but dad why does it sound like you're not gonna bring me on this mission with you? Because I'm not Sanosuke rebuffed, I've told you before that it's your friend's decision to tell you any of his secrets, not mine. After we return from the land of snow, if he thinks it's right to reveal what he's learned, only then will you know the truth. I'm sorry Tenten, but that's just the way things need to be for now, why don't we sit down for lunch, and then head out back. Even with the atmosphere charged with mystery and edgy weight the trio did indeed sit down to eat. Though as Naruto finally bit into his sandwich the Chunin felt compelled to ask what Sanosuke needed from a place as far away as the land of snow. They're very good with metal work, the weapon shop owner answered, as well as the best place to purchase rare alloys for special tools or powerful upgrades to an existing weapon. Rumor has it, Kubai Kiriboko was smelted from a metal deposit found during the village's early founding at that's what gives it the power to absorb blood. From the sound of it, Yuki no Kui has discovered a number of new deposits since then, and they may even help strengthen my sword. They just might no one's ever actually been known to test its ability beyond iron the blade may very well be capable of absorbing a great many things Naruto. And even if it can't I've no doubt Snow's blacksmiths can do some great work with Kubai Kiriboko that'll have you leaving with a sword at least twice as powerful as the one you've got now. That connected a set of dots in Tenten's mind. And that's part of why you're inviting him, isn't it? You want to help him get stronger. I do. But. Naruto struggled with this revelation, you don't even really know me, why would you go through so much for a stranger? Because it's what your mother would have wanted. What I should have done from the beginning. Kushina Izumaki was a very special woman to me, someone I looked up to and respected. And now that I have even the slightest chance to feel like I've helped let her soul rest in peace I want to take it. If you'll let me. It was another tense silence then, one only broken by the blonde getting up slowly and putting his dirty dishes away before the sound of running finally stopped and Naruto spoke again. I've been trying hard to grow up lately to be smarter and more mature with my decisions Mr. Segura, so you'll have to forgive me if I'm skeptical of your intentions and whether or not I can trust you. But, being Ten Chan's father and seeing what sort of person your daughter has grown into, I'm willing to give you one chance to prove yourself. Blue locked with brown as the Chunin turned from the sink, and neither of the two could keep themselves from clenching their jaw. I'll go with you to the land of snow but, if it turns out to be a trick, I'll unleash everything I have to destroy you, even if it means severing my bond with Ten Chan. And now hold on, the girl in question squawked, there's no need to talk like that. My dad would never minus. Then there's nothing to worry about Ten Chan. I want to trust your dad, I do, but you need to understand that there's a very important reason why even knowing his relation to you isn't enough, something I promise I'll tell you later. The bun-haired girl stared down the younger boy with a harsh stare, chocolate brown eyes glinted hard with determination as she stepped around the table. After the mission then, it wasn't a question when you both come back you'll tell me about it, about this thing my dad says he can't we're friends, Naruto, in fact I think you may honestly be my best friend and 
I don't want there to be any secrets between us, okay. He could easily see how badly she needed this to know her friend would be honest with her, and it helped cement the knowledge that Ten Ten really did see him as someone special to her, making it all that much easier to accept her request. No more secrets, I promise. It was a tender, if not a bit hard moment. One that was shattered by the exaggerated cough of the girl's father. Dad. Sorry, I just wanted to remind you I was here. I've seen those eyes before on teenagers and I'm not ready to watch you and your boyfriend make out in front of me just yet Tenny. A matching blush erupted across both teens' cheeks, but the girls burned all the brighter at her father revealing such an old nickname. D-Dad, shut up, and I told you to stop calling me that. Ah, uh, let your old man have his memories Tenny besides, I don't hear any complaints about being Naruto's Ten-Chan. Can we just go out back to spar now, please? A blustering Naruto readily agreed, and together they scurried out of the kitchen with Sanosuke following behind laughing as he went. When they finally made it into the small family's training area, the blonde was surprised to see that their backyard was bigger than he'd expected. I thought you'd just have a dirt ring carved into your grass, never would have guessed you guys would build an actual arena patch that's pretty cool. Yeah well, it's the way I was trained as a boy so it seemed like the best way to train Ten Ten too. But we'll have more time to talk about that sort of stuff while on the way to Yuki no Kuni for now let me grab my Zambito, and we'll get started with our exhibition. You don't practice weapon mastery like Ten Chan, Naruto wondered as he watched Sanosuke move over towards a small shed he'd noticed after walking outside. Now, the man hollered with his upper body leaning into the single story building. It's not really my style. I own the shop because I know how important each of those tools is for someone's survival in the field, and I've seen most of them in action, but when it comes to actual use Tenny's got more practical experience than I'll ever have. It was after a bit of grunting that the man pulled out one of the largest weapons Naruto had ever seen, wider and longer than even his own sword. The thing was covered in nicks and stains of blood, its edge dulled so much that the blonde was sure it couldn't cut no matter how hard Sanosuke swung. I can see it in your eyes, you don't think my sword is gonna be a challenge, but what you need to remember kid, is that it's not the weapon a warrior worries about, rather the one who wields it. The pair stood in the ring now, their weapons drawn and stances strong, eyes locked with knuckles tight around the hilts of their swords. Breaths came deep and slow, and the two fighters' muscles tensed in preparation for the first move. So, Sanosuke breathed, if you think you're ready to face me, bring it on. Naruto wasn't prepared for his opponent to immediately launch the worn Zanbito like a spear, and nearly ended up skewered by the rounded tip. Jumping to the side though proved to be a mistake, and the Chunin was met with a hard punch to the face that left him open for a combination of strikes to his chest. A vague memory of being slammed by Gera's sand flickered through Naruto's mind, right before sense returned to him long enough to leap away from a second set of strikes. Stumbling as his ribs cried out in pain, the Jinchuriki barely managed to catch Sanosuke as the man came charging at him with an overhead swing of his newly retrieved weapon. Throwing Kubai Kiraboko up to block though nearly sent Naruto to his knees, and the Chunin felt his teeth rattle before stabilizing himself. The very first thing I told you, Ten Ten's father admonished, was to watch your opponent. If this had been a real fight, I'd have killed you by now. Another push, and the blonde did drop to one knee with a grimace before he used the substitution technique to get away. Now off to the side, Naruto flung his blade like shuriken and shunshined as Sanosuke deflected it with his own Zandato, floating a moment in the air he propelled himself back like a rocket with a single gale palm. Tenten's father leapt back to avoid but got another shock as his blonde foe shot after him with the use of another wind jutsu, who by Kiraboko left laying in the dirt. Twisting around the older man's powerful thrust, Naruto unsheathed his kodeki and tried to find a shot at Sanosuke's shoulder. As the spiky brunette spun on his heels to dodge though Kanaha's Jinchuriki planted his palm against the dirt and worked into a roll as the blunted edge of an old sword whooshed through the air. Shifting into an attempt at Tenten's Gatotsu then, Naruto tried to drive his short sword along the edge of Sanosuke's side, only to find himself smashed by a full 360 spin of the man's blade that sent him flying out of the ring. Naruto. Alarmed, Tenten rushed to the down Chunin side with a mask of worry settled firmly over her face. Kneeling beside him, the bun-haired Kunuichi helped sit him up as Naruto groaned in pain. Back inside the ring, 
Sanosuke watched with intrigue as his eyes glinted with fatherly amusement. I'd say that's enough kid, you did good. I can see you understand the length of Kubai Kiriboko can't be used to its fullest because of your height, and that Kodeki makes a great secondary weapon with your increase in speed after dropping the head cleaver but the fact you let go of your blade so much at all shows me you've still got a long way to go before you're ready to truly call yourself its owner. Sanosuke walked over to his daughter and her crush, Zanato slung carelessly over his shoulders, as he continued to assess the boy. Besides that though, your creativity can't be denied, and I think if this had been in a bigger setting things would have gotten a little rough for me thanks to your shadow clone technique. I guess what I'm ultimately trying to say is they did a good thing promoting you Naruto. Are really? Ten Ten and her father could clearly see the disbelief that shone in their guest's eyes, and the girl felt the way her heart clenched at the sight. I it's just that, here the boy looked out at nothing I've been wondering lately if my jump to Chunin was a mistake, if maybe I wasn't ready. S so it feels nice to know at least one person I don't know says that to me, you know. A strong, calloused hand found its way atop the young shinobi's head then drawing Naruto startled attention. Well, kiddo, I'll bet you those kinds of thoughts will be a thing of the past after our mission trust me. Now, shake it off and show me what you've got against Tenny remind her what level she needs to reach. Feeling a bit cheered up and pumped for a rematch with his friend Naruto did his best to shake off the melancholy that had just plagued him, and with a firm nod walked his way back towards the ring. Ten Ten followed behind, a grin on her own pretty face and pulled out a pair of kunai to start off their spar. Get ready blondie, I'm not gonna go easy on you this time. Just be ready to buy me all the ramen, I can eat later after you lose Tenny. Blushing hot. The Kunoichi gave a growl before she leapt forward. Shut your stupid face, you big dummy. Sanasuke's roaring laughter could be heard around the block. XXX. The sun was beginning to dip, and his muscles were creaming for a break, but Kibal and Nozuka refused to pay such trivial things any attention. Rather, the snarling Genin went on slashing away at the tree bark surrounding him as he flipped and bounced around through training field 8. With Hinata's promotion, Squad 8 had been sidelined beyond basic D-rank missions until a suitable replacement could be found for her, leaving both the Inazuka and the Bahrain to find training of their own till such a time came. For Kiba however, the rabid teen found this to be a more preferred method just thinking of the lecture Shino would try to give him on pushing himself gave the boy a headache. Yet, thinking like this only served to draw Kiba's mind towards the reason he was pushing himself Sasuke Uchiha. Hearing of the other boy's lack of promotion did indeed feed the Inuzuka's desire for karmic justice to a degree, but that primal hunger for revenge still ate away at Kiba's very core and roared at him to avenge the loss of his comrade. Day in day out sun up to sun down time held no relevance for the young shinobi as he pushed his body to its limits and then some. Even the scent of his own blood, dripping from bare feet as they skidded against the forest floor, failed to catch the canine like teen's attention. It wasn't until he launched a vicious spin kick into the center training post, and one particular scent reached his nostrils that Kiba's attention snapped away from training. And onto the approaching form of a figure shrouded in the darkness of the tree line. You know, it's almost funny, I chose this path because I didn't expect anyone to be here, I guess I should have listened to that nagging feeling in my brain after all. That scent, the arrogant undertone to the owner's words, and the way he swaggered out from the forest as if he owned the whole of Konoha, Kiba knew of only one person who could pull all of that off so effortlessly. Sasuke. Uchiha. That is my name, but I'm afraid I don't have the time to chat with you Kiba, I've got an important appointment to keep so I'll have to cut this conversation short. Had he been in any state to care, the Inuzuka's typically sharp eyes would have taken notice of Sasuke's missing headband, as well as the fact no Genin would be given a mission alone at this time of day, but in his fury Kiba could only make out that his chance to take revenge on the Uchiha would sip through his fingers if he let the dark-haired clan heir walk away from him. I don't think so, Kiba stalked away from the training post to hunch down in Sasuke's path, you and I have unfinished business, your crime will not go unpunished. Sasuke's handsome face shifted into an annoyed, yet curious visage before a moment of thought had it switching places, with a look of condescending amusement. Laughter, cold and cruel, slithered from between the Achiha heir's lips a second later as he looked down his nose at the furious Inuzuka with his good eye. 
don't tell me you honestly still think this village is going to execute me or even put me in prison, just because I beat you and your stupid mutt during the exams. Grow up Kiba, I won that match by the book. Sasuke's face screwed up into a delightfully cruel smirk now. If you've got a problem, take it up with the proctor. He's the one who didn't call the match after I lost my eye. He could have saved your fucking pet, but chose to let the match continue minus. You didn't have to kill a Kamaru. Spittle and foam began to color the corners of Kiba's mouth now, and the sound of knuckles popping accompanied his jagged tattoos beginning to glow as chakra began to swell up from within. Your eye can be replaced, Akamaru was a living breathing friend as well as comrade. What you did should be considered murder, but because your sensei is a hypocrite and our village kisses your ass it's up to me to make sure you get what you rightfully deserve. The look on Sasuke's face intensified then, and his Sharingan activated as the former rookie of the year held out his arms wide, and began to chuckle once more. Oh, is it now? Then please, mighty mutt, show me just how much you hate me, show me the strength of your vengeance. Needing no better opening, Kiba shot forward with a guttural snarl in an effort to finish their fight in a single shot. For the Uchiha however, this was child's play to block after the month of training Kakashi had given him for the finals, and he merely swatted the attack aside before grabbing the sleeve of Kiba's filthy jacket, and swinging him around. A single well-placed, leg saw the Inazuka stumbling to the ground a moment later. Yet, he rolled into the momentum and pushed back onto his feet where he dodged Sasuke's incoming combo of swift punches. Trying for a leg sweep, Kiba leapt forward into the grass after its failure and kicked both legs back as he planted the palms of his hands into the earth. Sasuke flipped back and over, the attempt before taking hold of his opponent's ankles and swinging the feral teen up into the air and landing himself back to the ground. Smirking, the Uchiha flashed quickly through a set of hand signs and soon let loose a vicious volley of fireballs into the air after Kiba. Watching as they all exploded, Leaving a cloud of dark smoke, the Uchiha tried to search out the other boy's charred body with the help of his dajutsu. And that's when the nausea came. Kiba cursed the Sharingan as his enemy managed to avoid him even after substituting behind for a tackle and instead wound himself into a Gatsuga to follow after the Uchiha. But by now Sasuke was getting tired of playing around with Kiba. The former Leaf Genin danced around his enemy's attack with ease taking full advantage of the feral boy's exhausted state and declining mental health before calling forth the power of Orochimaru's curse mark. It would draw attention, but Sasuke was sure any who came running would be too late. All I need is a single shot. XXX. I, I guess in my excitement, I'd forgotten about promising dad I would handle the close-up while he goes to see how Hayate is doing but we can definitely go get ramen after you guys mission. Right? Naruto had been more than a little disappointed that he and Tenten's time together was over, but the prospect of a rain check helped mollify him even if he was hungry again. The blonde found he always had a great appetite after a spar, and now that the thought of ramen ran through his mind Naruto's stomach wouldn't stop grumbling. But as the familiar smell of Ichiraku ramen tickled his nose though, the Jinchuriki's eyes widened at a sight he never thought he'd see. Sitting there, her platinum blonde hair down around her shoulders and dressed in a new casual outfit, Ino Yamanaka huddled over a single steaming bowl of noodles. The powder blue spaghetti strapped shirt, and those snow white jean shorts that cuffed at her creamy thighs, gave Naruto pause as he took in a side of the heiress he'd never seen before. Normally the girl's sense of style delayed an air of haughty self-importance befitting Ino's spoiled nature. It showed off that the platinum blonde was among, if not the most, beautiful girls in their age range, while complimenting the Yamanaka's perfect skin and drawing attention to her expressive eyes. Now however Naruto found himself stunned at the calm and quiet atmosphere seeming to roll off of Ino in waves settling the excited nerves that had sparked at the thought of filling his gut with ramen. The blonde took a deep breath as he began to step closer, and the faint hint of flowers carried its way to his nose with a tropical hint tinting the aroma as Ino brushed back her hair. It was the memory of his own words however, that snapped Naruto out of his reverence. Ino was beautiful yes, but that didn't mean the person on the inside had changed as easily as the girl's clothes. The desire to sit next to her was there though hormones buzzed to life and the Jinchuriki felt the swell of teenage desire creep its way into his heart. 
to be seen, if only by a chosen few, sharing a meal with the heiress to a well-known clan who just so happened to be the beauty of Kanaha's newest batch of rookies spoke to the lonely boy who painted the Hokage monument for attention. And that's when he knew. Naruto still had his own growing to do. What sort of relationship could they have, even if Ino's feelings were real, so long as Naruto subconsciously always saw the girl as a trophy, something to have on display. Something to say look at what I have. A sour pit formed in the blonde stomach then, and the once delicate aroma of a faraway island turned pungent and nauseating. The heat of boyish shame flooded whisker cheeks as the back of Naruto's neck grew itchy, and it was with heavy steps that he turned to walk away. Yet he didn't get very far. It wasn't the call of his name though that stopped him, but a sensation the blonde last felt during the Sanin showdown, killer intent. Not as intense, but supremely more malicious, Naruto could already see some of the civilians stopping as they were forced under a hate-filled weight they'd never experienced before so vibrant was the key. And it was as he noticed this, that the blonde's mind snapped back to the only other times he's ever felt the sort of pressure hanging in the air. Eyes sharpening with focus, the whisker Chunin sprang into action and began to sprint like lightning to reach his target as soon as possible. Orochimaru wasn't foolish enough to let himself be so easily exposed, which could only mean one thing Sasuke. And as Naruto bolted beyond the village wall's senses sharp, he wondered just what could have set the angry Achiha off enough to activate his curse seal. Arriving on the scene moments later, about a mile out from Konoha, the Jinchuriki found the answer to be more gruesome than he'd expected. Gone was his former teammate, but laying with his face in a puddle of his own blood was the body of Kiba Inuzuka. Surrounded by the likes of Kakashi, Kirena, and a few others Naruto couldn't get his brain to truly process the sight, his classmate was dead. Chapter 17 Revenge of the Spiral What do you mean, I can't go after the little bastard, he nearly killed my son. I know that, but there's no telling who Sasuke Uchiha is meeting to take him into Odo, for all we know, it'll be Orochimaru himself. Tanae pinched the bridge of her nose trying desperately to fight off the exhaustion seeping into her body as she listened to Tsum in Uzuka continue her rant. Saving the woman's son had taken all night Sasuke's Kudari had landed opposite of Kiba's heart. Whether through quick thinking or the Achiha Rouge's carelessness one couldn't be sure all Tsunade knew was that Kiba was very lucky to still be breathing. Listen Tsum, I've sent a squad of Andu to track down Sasuke and have him return to face punishment. With the charges against him, it's highly probable he'll be executed once his DNA's been taken minus. What for? That clan is nothing but a shell of the disgusting monster it used to be why can't we just be rid of them for good? Sinead felt her restraint snap a little. Because our world doesn't work like that. Like it or not, the sharing gan is a powerful tool and not having it weakens our village significantly. The Hokage felt her breaths coming out ragged and forced herself not to reach under the table for her bottle of alcohol stashed in the corner. Instead the blonde pushed herself to her feet and turned towards the window so as to stare out at the village. You weren't there, Tsum. You didn't see what the Uchiha clan is truly capable of with those eyes of theirs, Kakashi can't even scratch the surface of the Sharingan's true power. Soon heard how her village leader's tone seemed to grow hollow and quiet and saw through the reflection of glass that Sinead's mind had traveled back to a time and place the Inuzuka matriarch could never know about. The quiet atmosphere began to unsettle her however, so Tsum swallowed her anger the best she could and bowed to the pig-tailed blonde before excusing herself. Yet even as she left, closing those strong wooden doors behind her the mother of two swore to herself that she'd make Sasuke Uchiha pay dearly for everything he'd put her family through damn the consequences. So blinded was she that Tsum didn't notice when she passed the trio of Naruto, Sanosuke and Hayate as they now made their way towards Tsunade's office. But the blonde Chunin did notice the mother of his former classmate. Do you guys really think she's still gonna let us go out on this mission after last night? We'll be fine, Sanosuke waved him off, the deserter isn't any real harm to the village since he didn't know anything and the way he was apparently trying to leave means his choice wasn't born out of a desire to hurt the village. Hayate popped a small, yellow sphere into his mouth before agreeing with the other man. Besides, the sickly jown and added snow country isn't anywhere near Odokagur, so we'll be fine regardless. This carried them the rest of the way, but when Sanosuke knocked on the door they each heard their cage groan before calling them in. 
Only Naruto paid attention to the little saucer set on her desk. I get why you two are here, but what's one of my chunin doing with you? Well, Sanosuke spoke first, Ma'am Hayate and I were hoping you'd allow us to take young Izumaki along with us on our supply mission. What for? How is sending you off with one of my newest chunin any benefit for a mission like this? Hayate coughed, though not as horribly as usual, before attempting to give an answer. With all due respect Lady Hokage, this goes far beyond our mission to the village, it's an effort to keep a promise to someone important. Tsunade stared down her jounin, and the former rebel with a furrowed brow and hard set to her jaw. A bit late for that, don't you two think? It's been, what 13 years? Why choose now? Because I want to go, Naruto countered. He stepped into the Hokage's line of sight, and made sure not to blink with every word that came next. I met Tenten's dad right before the discovery of Kiba's beaten body, and after a bit of sparring, he offered me a chance to accompany him and Hayate San to Snow Country, I accepted. One of Tsunade's elegant eyebrows arched. And you think you're in a position to mail such a request, Chunin? Especially after your recent troubles? The whiskered boy's answer wasn't anything like the adults expected. No, but after what I've been told about this place I feel like I need to go, to get stronger better. To become the kind of man who'd never make such a careless mistake ever again. There was something else, she could see it in his eyes, so with a wave of her hand Sinead ordered the two older men to leave. I need to have a talk with Izumaki before I make my final decision, you two can get started on your own packing in the meantime. She hadn't even spared them a glance with her words, and both knew this meant there was no questioning Sinead's decision, so with a few parting words to Naruto they left the two blondes alone. The Jinchuriki watched then, after the door was shut, as Sinead began to weave a series of hand signs before pressing a single finger against the center of her desk. He felt a pulse, just for a moment, but once it passed Naruto could feel that something was different about Sinead's office. It's a special silencing seal handed over to the cage so that no one can eavesdrop on their private meetings. Naruto scoffed, so you're a mind reader now. No dummy, the question was just written all over your face. Now, mind telling me about what your real reason for going to snow is. The younger blonde lost his mask of annoyance in an instant, and in its place sat a look of grim confliction. It was quiet in the Hokage's office then, and the silence stretched on for what felt like hours before Naruto finally decided to break it. Because I got this the day I became a Chunin, and now I need to find someone in Snow Country who can make my sword stronger so that I can find out the truth behind what happened to my mother. Tsunade nearly fumbled the rolled up letter thrown to her at Naruto's admission, but after seeing how cold the boy's own eyes had gotten she felt more inclined to believe him. Then, she unrolled the letter, and her jaw dropped after reading what was inside. And Naruto, who gave you this? I'm pretty sure it was that perverted old sage, though I can't really remember. But I've seen how the freak writes, so I know he wasn't the one who actually penned the letter. Sinead immediately noticed something. You didn't tell him about this, did you? There's no way he'd know about what's written here and not tell me. Naruto, how come you minus? Because you're the only one I feel like I can trust Sinead. You weren't here during the Nine Tails attack so I don't believe you had anything to do with what may or may not have happened to my mother. The young Chunin scrubbed his face with his hands as he sighed and settled heavily into the chair set before the Hokage's desk. All my life I've wondered about my parents, but now that I'm finding out my father might be some edge lord stooge I just... I just don't know. Not to mention what this would do to the village, Sinead lamented to herself. The Yodaim was a celebrated hero for heaven's sake. If word got out that the shining star of Konoha was a brainwashed figurehead, Tune didn't even want to think about what sort of shit storm that would kick up. Just imagining the sort of civil war Naruto's letter could cause made the Godain want to puke. So, she pinched the bridge of her nose and let out her own heavy breath before telling Naruto he could go to Snow Country. I don't know just how true, if at all, this document is but there's one thing I do agree with it on, Danzo Shimura. He's one of the three village elders, right? Tsunade chuckled ruefully at the boy's innocent answer, though she couldn't blame him either. That's putting it mildly, he's as old as the third was. Older now. 
Danzo is as shady as they come and has bribed, blackmailed, or killed to get to where he is today. The blonde cage stopped for a moment to retrieve the bottle of sake she'd kept stashed away and poured herself a drink before continuing. His goal is to become the Hokage and turn the entire village into a full military state. It's because of what I know about him that I'm inclined to believe this letter. No matter how much I don't want to. Naruto settled back in his seat crossing his arms as Tsunade took a second shot. So you're letting me get stronger more so as a deterrent against Danzo and any schemes he might be cooking up behind the scenes now that a new Hokage is in town, is that it? Tsunade sighed. She noticed she'd been doing that a lot lately. Technically, yes. But I am going to work with you to uncover the mystery behind this letter, so if any of this is true you'll have the power to help your mother rest a little easier. The young Chunin scoffed, not too happy with being used as a piece in a game he didn't even want to play, but accepted the deal nonetheless. I guess that means I should hurry up and pack then, I'm okay to assume you'll let Hayate-san and Sanosuke know I'm going too. I will, Tsunade gave a firm nod just try to stay alive out there Chunin is maki snow country isn't as polite as the land of fire. The pair of blondes managed to share a smile despite their last words and Naruto gave a salute as he went to walk out the door. I'll do my best to remember that, Hokage-sama. But, if you'll let me, I'd like to ask about bringing just one other person along for the mission. XXX. As Kanaha's Jinchuriki was heading home for his latest assignment, the boy's biggest admirer had just finished her morning training and was heading to Ichiraku in hopes of catching the blonde. Hinata felt as though she'd been in a different dimension with how little the heiress had left her clan's compound. Days and evenings were packed with enough training that the kunoichi could hardly keep her eyes open at dinner before collapsing into bed. But it'll be worth it when I can show Naruto-kun how strong I'm becoming. Images of the whisker Chunin gushing about her leaps in strength and eventual awakening of the Byakugan's more advanced levels filled Hinata's mind and made the heiress giggle happily as she nearly skipped through the streets. She'd even put on a new outfit, one the village princess had bought because she was sure it would catch Naruto's eye, but had been too shy until now to wear it in public. The pastel, orange summer dress dropped down to Hinata's knees while flowing over her growing curves like water. A white sun hat rested over the girl's shoulder-length dark hair, trimmed by an orange ribbon, while white sandals replaced Hinata's usual mission boots. Over her shoulder, the giddy kunoichi's purse swung with every excited step she took, its lining packed to bursting with enough money to spend an entire day eating ramen with the blonde of her dreams. After all, they say the best way to a man's heart is through his stomach. Hinata was just imagining what her and Naruto's wedding would be like when she turned the corner and spotted the Chunin's favorite hangout. But there was no sign of Naruto. The only person seated at the bar was the girl Hinata knew to be on Neji's team. Sagging a little at this discovery, Hinata tried to console herself with the fact Naruto had to come by eventually for lunch, so she'd just wait for him. Besides, my afternoon training doesn't start for another few hours and I haven't been called in for any missions lately. I'm sure it'll be fine. With this uplifting idea Hinata's shoulders lifted again, and she was just about to continue her skipping when Neji's teammate let out an embarrassed shriek. What? No, I don't, we're just friends. Immediately Hinata assumed the bun-haired girl was talking about Neji, and she giggled behind her hand at the idea of the stern Hyuga managing to get a girlfriend. However this was just the thing she could use to pass the time, so the young heiress quietly shuffled to the side of Ikirakus and used the transformation technique to look like an unassuming brunette before sliding into the stall and taking a seat. Beside her, Tenten froze for a moment at the new arrival, but after noticing that she didn't recognize this girl decided it was safe to continue denying Iaim's crazy claims. Totally unaware of the consequences. L look, Naruto's a great guy and all, B, but just because we have a good time hanging out doesn't mean I W want to be his girlfriend. She didn't take notice of how the other girl's fingers suddenly tightened around her menu. And apparently, neither did I aim Ichiraku. Ah, come on who do you think you're kidding with cheeks that red just admit it. You've at least got a crush on the lovable goofball. Ten Ten covered her ever reddening face with her menu with a squeak. And no way, you're just s seeing things. Who'd like a, a show off like Naruto? I aim had a face like the cat that caught the canary, and she leaned over the counter to gently pull Tenten's makeshift shield away. 
Then, the cute ramen chef propped her chin with a single hand as she pointed a single finger at the weapon mistress. I say you would, otherwise, why else would you be hanging out around here without even ordering anything? Especially since you said yourself Naruto was about to head out on a mission. W well, she's doing it. Hey, where'd the other girl go? During the teasing Hinata had slipped away, leaving Tenten at the mercy of Naruto's self-appointed matchmaker. I didn't see anyone, I am shrugged before sending the younger girl a cheeky grin, or are you just trying to distract me so I don't ask you about Naruchan's smile next? Despite her best efforts Tenten did wind up pulling up a mental image of the very smirk I aim was talking about. She even started to get lost in a daydream before a chorus of playful laughter shocked the genin back to the real world. So, tell me again how you don't have a crush on our favorite blonde. Tenten groaned, can I just order now, please? XXX. At the same time, in the land of snow, Princess Koiki struggled to keep her breathing in check as she huddled inside of a small cave in the mountains. Beyond the crude doorway she could hear the howling snowstorm as icy pellets rained from the sky. But there was something else too, something sinister outside. Dodo's henchman. How he'd managed to buy the skills of three former members of the Seven Swordsmen Koiki couldn't even begin to fathom. But thanks to them she and her people were completely cut off from the outside world. As tears leaked from her eyes, the former actress couldn't help but wonder, what had she done to deserve this? All Koiki'd ever wanted was to see her face on the big screen, yet here she was running for her life because her own uncle was trying to kill her over a throne she didn't even want. As she agonized over what sort of horrible fate awaited her if Dodo's assassins got a hold of her, Koiki sent out a silent plea wet with tears for someone. Anyone, so save her. XXX. Itachi and Kaizam walked quietly from another meeting with the Akatsuki. Birds chirped in the trees and wind rustled the leaves, but both men were silent until they felt the omnipotent pressure of Lord Pain lift from their shoulders. The guy isn't even here, and he still makes my blood run cold, I don't know how you stand it Itachi. Practice my father carried himself the same way. Growing up, I treated speaking with him like a training exercise to better conceal my true thoughts. Kaizam scoffed. I can't imagine the chief of police holding a candle to an overbearing weight like our terrifying leader. Not now, obviously, but when you're a four-year-old child who's just starting to learn how to be a shinobi your father may as well be scarier than the death god himself. The shark-like missing ninja hummed as they walked, taking in his partner's words and mulling them over with a critical eye. You almost sound like you miss him, he finally said. Itachi was silent his dark eyes staring, unblinking ahead. It was silent again, but only for a moment before a new voice rang out as the pair came upon a waterfall. Those sorts of feelings are common for a young man, even Itachi isn't immune to human emotions. Both men slid down easily to one knee and bowed their heads before a light laugh drew their attention. How many times have I told you, that's not necessary. I may lead our little rebellion, but all I require is your trust and loyalty. I've no need for grandstanding. Beneath the shadow of their hood it was impossible for one to see just what this mysterious figure looked like, while an influx of chakra to their vocal cords kept their voice laced with an ever-changing accent. But, seated leisurely atop the rounded surface of an impeded boulder, it was hard to imagine that the lackadaisical newcomer could hold any sway over such legendary and frightening shinobi. And yet they're every bit as scary as Itachi when he uses those crazy eyes of his Kaizam grasped. The Achiha himself merely offered a sigh before standing again. You'll have to excuse us, it's become a force of habit. I'm well aware a playful smirk tugged at the hooded figure's lips, from what I've managed to gather about him, Payne is quite the theatrical individual. This time Kaizam chuckled. You've got no real idea sometimes I wonder if he practices his speeches in front of a mirror. He's so precise and well-spoken, it's almost unreal. The figure shrugged, if he's to he the god of a new world order it imagine he needs to be Mr. Hoshigate. But enough about that, I've just gotten word about you two's next assignment. Both men subconsciously shifted to stand a little straighter at this, their eyes gleaming with determination and a drive to succeed. Naruto will be heading to the land of snow soon, and I want you both to follow him. You'll be making sure nothing kills the boy, but also, I want Itachi to reveal himself. 
This got a raised brow from the rogue Achiha, while Kaizam grumbled about his partner getting to have all the fun. You'll get your chance again soon, the hooded figure laughed, as he'll need help learning how to better wield his weapon. They stood up then, dusting off their robe as they continued to speak. As you know Kaizam, many swords increase their strength by at least tenfold after a single trip to Snow Country. Who better to teach him how to harness that power than a member of the greatest group of swordsmen to ever live? While this helped to placate the moody fishman, Kaizam still had one more issue with the plan. That still doesn't explain why only Itachi gets to reveal himself to the kid. If I'm supposed to teach him too, why shouldn't we both talk to him? This time it was the former Anbu who spoke, answering his partner's unhappy inquiry with a line Kaizam wouldn't have expected in a million lifetimes. Because who better to tell the son of Kushina about her life and demise than the woman's only student? Another laugh slipped by the hooded figure's lips as they watched Kaizam's eyes bug, and his jaw nearly hit the floor. You mean Itachi never told you? I never thought it mattered, shrugged the Achiha prodigy. His partner sputtered before glaring hard at the younger man. How can you say that? Don't you know who she was, what she could do? Kushina is a Maki Minus. Was a friend, mother, and mentor. She was taken from this world before her time, and now I'm going to do everything in my power to see that those responsible pay dearly. Seeing the activation of Adachi's main cue silenced Kaizam, and he struggled to breath under the steady leak of killer intent coming off of his friend in waves. Their true leader however, seemed totally unfazed by this and spoke freely. Well said Itachi Danzo and his fellow pigs will soon meet their ends. Which brings us back nicely to your new mission. And with the nine tails as your intended target, it won't seem out of place at all to pain. Kaizam caught something in their words, and a cheeky grin showed off his sharpened teeth as he went on to speak. So I guess this means the jig is almost up huh? No more red clouds. You could hear the smile in the mastermind's voice as they spoke next. That's right, your days in the Akatsuki are over. It's time for the sun to set on Pain's dream, and with it will rise a new dawn. A single, small hand slid out from the figure's cloak fixed in the release seal. In a flux of chakra their cloaks all rippled, and soon enough the very symbol of the Akatsuki was replaced with a mark matching that of Itachi and Kaizam's true leader. A brilliant blood-red spiral. Bukuraru. That's it for this part if you enjoyed it then like, share and subscribe for more and also check out my other playlist hope you would like them too.